very much. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, okay, so uh, my name is Patrick Peterson, and I'm representing the Constitution. And I wanted to start just by thanking the judges. I know it's a tough job to go through all this all week, so thanks for taking the time. I wanted to start with uh, a typical thrust time curve for a motor, and I'm using the S to C6, which uh, will become apparent when I'm showing that here in a moment. Uh, you know, here's a thrust of this motor at the peak is 14 newtons. It, it thrusts over a 1.86 second thrust duration and it has an impulse of 8.82 newton seconds. Now the interesting thing is that for a piston launcher, the piston and the motor are interacting only over a very short time at the beginning of the motor's thrust. So it's roughly around 3 tenths of a second where the motor has its spike as shown in the diagram here. So for our study, the key questions that we wanted to address were, do piston launchers provide only an improved efficiency, in other words, less wasted impulse for the motor, or can piston launchers actually add impulse on top of the motor's rated value? And further, are there other ways in which the thrust time curve is altered by piston launchers? So what our goal was, was to develop a general methodology to, in effect, define piston adjusted thrust and have a way of measuring it that was reliable. So we wanted a well-defined and directly comparable measure to the motor thrust time curve, applicable to nearly any type of motor-piston combination, measurable from simple static tests, and would essentially tell us how the piston effectively redraws the motor's curve. So I want to start out now by showing you the static test that we did. It's a, it's a very simple type of static test, but it captures the essential forces at work in a piston launcher. So these are 150 centimeter tall, clear polycarbonate tubing. They're open at the top. Uh, we chose 150 centimeters, but the length is arbitrary. Uh, I recommend long lengths. A movable piston unit is inside. It can set, be set up with any internal ballast to any weight desired can be set at any initial volume. Uh, we tested two different weights at three different initial volumes uh, using the same batch C6 motors. The motors fire upward, the piston launches out of the tube. It's a very simple test. Now here's a photograph of our testing layout, and you can see from the picture we mark distances directly on the tubes. That's the way to get the most accurate reading from a 1,000 frame per second video which provides a time clock in which to actually measure the velocity as we see the pistons reach uh, various milestone distances. And then we, from this we can derive acceleration uh, as well as thrust. But first we had to define what, what we meant by piston adjusted thrust. It, it, it wasn't an, an initially obvious, so we had to do a little bit of work, a little bit of mathematics to figure out what was the right definition. Uh, what you see here is the result of our, of our analysis that piston-adjusted thrust is most appropriately defined as the sum of the motor thrust in the tube added to the force due to piston pressure, subtracting the forces due to ambient pressure and friction in the tube. A key aspect of this definition is that both weight and aerodynamic drag are not subtracted, and that's because for a motor thrust time curve, the weight of the motor or the, you know, the aerodynamic drag of, of the of rocket that will be flown are not subtracted. Now one of the beautiful aspects of, of this, or one of the things that, that I felt was quite elegant, was that our static testing allows for a very easy way to calculate this piston adjusted thrust. In other words, I, I don't need to know specifically teasing out each of these terms, what motor thrust in the tube is, what the pressure is. All I need to do is measure acceleration from the static test, and from that this simple formula here will calculate the piston thrust. So I want to move now to showing you again, this is the S to C6 thrust time curve for the first 0.324 seconds. I put it on a different scale here. So it's flattened out because we've only got a little over three tenths of a second on the horizontal axis and we've got a very large scale of thrust on the vertical axis. So here is my first example of, uh, from our testing of, of a piston adjusted thrust time curve. Okay, and there's, there's some interesting things to point out here. First of all, the thrust appears to come in waves. There's a first wave that kicks in, and then, there, and then the thrust drops, and then there's another wave after which the thrust drops. 
Interestingly, there is about one newton second of added impulse here, uh, but all of the added impulse comes after the first 75 centimeters of travel. Now this is very interesting from the point of view that most of our competitors think of a long piston as being about 30 inches, you know, about a 75 centimeter piston. So this is basically saying that if you, if you fly what, what has typically been thought of by NAR competitors as a long piston, you're going to get some advantage. You're going to get that first big thrust spike, which is much bigger. It's about two and a half times larger than the motor, the unassisted motor thrust spike. Uh, but there's no added impulse at that length. All the added impulse is going uh, in, in the second 75 centimeter. So this method allows us to evaluate length by starting with a test tube that is very long. We can evaluate different lengths and see you know, what lengths are, are most appropriate. Now the wave effect that we see here, or in other words, these periodic drops in thrust, were not entirely unexpected. Uh, there's a 1975 R&D by Jeff Landis. Landis studied half A6 motors and observed more frequent, cyclic, and less severe drops in thrust. However, I think the drops in thrust here may be how the Landis effect manifests with a more powerful motor. The effect appears to be specific to small volumes where gas molecules interact in a compact space. Now we don't know if we had used a longer tube whether we would continue to see more spikes. I sort of have a hunch that we would. As long as the motor keeps on burning, we're going to continue to get waves of pressure. Um, so what we see here may just be the first two spikes. Um, one of the things we did, though, based on Landis's work, is we hypothesized that some non-zero initial volume might mitigate this effect to some extent. And, and this was based on Landis's evaluation <coughs> that there should be some dampening of the, of the drops in thrust given a non-zero volume. And in fact, when you go to, as I show here, a, a small initial volume, this is a seven centimeter gap between the motor and the piston at, at ignition, it actually adds another full newton second of impulse. Now the thrust drops are still present, uh, but they have less of a negative impact. Obviously, we, we see two spikes which are bigger than in the zero volume case. The second spike is hitting a peak here of about 97 newtons. So we've effectively turned a motor with a 14 newton thrust spike into one with a 97 newton thrust spike. But again, nearly all of this impulse benefit is coming in the se second 75 centimeters of travel. Now, I wanted to say a word about the generalizability of these results. Uh, differences in impulse here, as we measured, are really very large. And they're too large to be due to random variation between motors or to error in measuring velocities. There may be some, there may, there, there's almost certainly some error, but not on this scale. If we had measured very low thrust, on the other hand, uh, this might have been explained in terms of leaky seals, bad fit, but the remarkable improvement in thrust that I've shown <coughs> can't occur by accident or by mistake. You can't just generate this big thrust by, by doing something stupid. So, so we believe this is a real effect. A couple other points I want to make that I think are interesting. Uh, first point is that the B6 motor, the SS B6, is nearly identical to the C6 in terms of the first three tenths of a second of the motor burn. So we expect these results would apply to the B6 motor as well. And then the other point that uh, I'll make is that the A3 motor uh, is roughly half the thrust during those 0.3 seconds as the B6 motor. And since the A3 motor would fire in a piston that is narrower and has roughly half the volume, uh, we would expect, under similar pressure, uh, at half the weight uh, uh, for an A3. So the A3 will behave similarly at half the weight. So the thrust curves I showed you were at about 150 gram weight, which is on the, on the order of a dual leg lofter. Uh, about half that weight is on the order of a payloader. So we thought these results would be applicable to the dual leg loft event at NARAM as well as the A payload event. Uh, and in fact, uh, when, we, when we designed pistons for these events, we, we flew 50 inch or larger, I think we actually flew 55 inch, Chan told me earlier, uh, 55 inch pistons in these events with small non-zero gaps based on the, the non-zero volume result we saw. And we did in fact take first place in both events as well as set new national altitude records in both events. So I, I see this as, 
a bit of an independent validation as well of the results. I mean, obviously a lot of factors can influence uh, competition and the results, but uh, certainly the piston, we believe, is a big part of, of our success. Uh, another point I want to raise here uh, has to do with uh, an earlier R&D report. Uh, and this, this was, I think, one of the most important R&Ds that's been done on pistons by uh, Robert and Peter Allway at NARAM 47. Uh, and they found a very large percent improvement in altitude uh, when testing uh, heavy models flown off of 30-inch pistons. And they used a B6 motor. So uh, as part of their report, they had suggested and did some calculations uh, arguing that the benefit here was due to added impulse. Uh, however, when we analyzed this, we felt that uh, there's perhaps an error in the assumption that they made. One of the assumptions they made was that the, the motor or the rocket that was firing not on a piston launcher actually used all of its impulse and, and were effectively their zero baseline for their calculation. I think it's actually very likely that a model flying without a piston launcher, particularly a very heavy model, uh, is actually going to have a lot of wasted impulse. And so, given the results that we have shown here, that uh, no piston at 75 centimeters or less, in other words, 30 inches or less, is really adding impulse, uh, we don't think their results are due to added impulse at all. They're, they're probably due to less wasted impulse and a bigger thrust bump. So there's still a big advantage in using a piston launcher with a heavy model uh, at lengths 30 inches or perhaps a little less even. Uh, but the really big benefit, the added impulse, comes from using a much longer piston out to perhaps as long as five feet. So I want to summarize by, by just kind of uh, capturing what I think are the, the, the key uh, conclusions to come away from here. Uh, obviously, you know, we didn't test a lot of motors, uh, and, and, and although we, we got some positive results from the competition based on what we tested, uh, I think what we've really achieved here is a general scientific method. We basically developed a whole method whereby you can test motors, you can test any motor you want using a, a system similar to ours, as long as you have a high-speed video camera, which are, you know, are not necessarily that, that expensive these days, you can do this test and you can, you can calculate fairly easily uh, uh, a motor thrust time curve, I'm sorry, a piston adjusted thrust time curve. So this is a methodology that uh, up to this point in time, uh, no one's ever done this before and I think it's potentially quite valuable to model rocketry. Uh, our methods have shown that you can add substantial impulse at, at long lengths of piston, much longer lengths than, than are typically used, uh, particularly with, with high weight. Uh, we've shown that you can shift, tighten, and multiply thrust spikes of the motor. Uh, this characteristic is not something that's ever been uh, really demonstrated before, so we've shown it very, in a very precise, quantitative way. Uh, we've also shown that inside of a piston, you may experience waves of thrust with drops of thrust, uh, which uh, you know, was observed by Jeff Landis in his 1975 report, and we've, we've seen something similar here. Uh, and finally, that Pistons may not perform optimally at zero volume. We, we've shown a very clear example where non-zero volume, a small non-zero volume, is vastly superior to a zero volume. Uh, so I'll stop there and take questions. You're, uh, you have a explanation of where the added impulse is coming from. You're capturing effectively all of the gas generated by the motor, no matter how much thrust it's putting out relative to the weight of the model. Is that really just the mechanical compression effect where you compressing the air, adding a lot of, of, of material in, in the piston and turning that into a mechanical? Yes, I mean, I think, I think you know, obviously all the energy is coming from the motor. Right. So the piston itself it doesn't, doesn't add energy, but when the motor is firing in the piston, it adds a tremendous amount of pressure, which generates, you know, in the right configuration, such as long length and, and under a, a heavy weight, uh, it can generate a tremendous amount of force. And, and that's what I think we've demonstrated here. You're also changing the back pressure on the motor. Are you suggesting that anything is actually going on in the motor itself, or is it just entirely from capturing the, the exhaust gas? Well, we don't really know for sure, but I, I believe, I think it's most plausible 
added thrust is coming primarily from the pressure of the exhaust gases inside the piston. Um, so, does that answer your question? Two things that came to mind, I don't know how significant they are, I don't know if you guys even tested for this, but um, one, a possible additional fuel source, is it possible the tube itself is burning and adding heat, which is going to cause more pressure inside the tube, and also, is it um, 
our engines are very inefficient. One of the measures of efficiency of a rocket motor is lack of an exhaust because that means you're just wasting some of that fuel as heat. It's possible you're recapturing that heat energy as it increases the pressure, you know, increase the heat, increase the pressure of the actual gas inside the tube. And maybe that's where the added impulse is coming from. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure. The second part of what you said, I'm not sure if it's fundamentally different than what, what I was saying, which is that, you know, it's capturing the exhaust gases and from that building pressure, which, which generates impulse, generates thrust. Uh, the first part of what you said about, you know, the burning of the tubes is, is adding impulse. I mean, I think you have to think about this in terms of, you know, this is all happening in three tenths of a second. So there, there, there's not a lot of burning. I mean, basically, that those those forces are moving upward quickly, and they're, you know, the, the, the part where the piston is, is, you know, it's moving up rapidly, and, you know, while the section of tube down here may be burning, you're not generating a tremendous amount of additional gas during that time. And it didn't, from what I was able to observe from the video, the bottom part of the tube didn't really start to clearly show signs of burning and melting, as I mentioned, until very late in the morning. I don't think that that's a contributing factor. <coughs> Mark? Yeah, hi, Jim. You mentioned that, maybe I didn't understand correctly, the, the distance between the head and the motor. Mm -hmm. And how much were the different variables with all of the pistons you launched, or was it simply just the, you mentioned four or five? Are you talking about the ones we flew in competition or, or the static test? The static testing. Okay, so the, the static testing, uh, I can show you the, the, the diagram again. So there were five pistons we tested. The first one had a very large non-zero volume. The second one was zero volume. And then the other three are all at the same non-zero volume, a small non-zero volume. Uh, the one on the far right was a narrower diameter, so to get the oh, okay. same volume, it, it's okay. okay. I didn't quite understand the first one. Thank you. So, Andrew, did you have any direct measurements of, of the pressures, or you were inferring the pressure waves from the accelerometer data? Yeah, the, the pressure waves are evident from the measured thrust, which we measure from acceleration, which was calculated from velocity. So, it's all done by visually looking at, you know, it's all based on visual measurements of velocity, and then from that you calculate back down the yeah. thrust. So it's, so it's, so it's thrust only. There's no accelerometer. There's no other you know, yeah. sensors to detect pressure. I mean, I think one of, the, one of the elegant things about this is it doesn't require going in and trying to figure out what the pressure is. You, know, you, can, you can determine thrust and, and actually draw a thrust time curve just doing this very simple static test and, and, and a simple videotape. Right. Okay. But it's a derived measurement. It's not a direct measurement. Yeah. And then, what methodology did you use to determine what the small uh, uh, non-zero volume was versus the large, just out of curiosity? How, how we chose those? Yeah. Uh, they're, they're somewhat arbitrary. I mean, you know, we, we've been sort of informally uh, through, you know, in competition events as well as just, you know, over the last few years, I've been informally testing some different non-zero volumes. George Gassaway, for example, had some, some things that he'd done, so he made some suggestions. And, and these were ones that, you know, sort of seemed like they were likely to, to show some differences. Um, for example, the large non-zero volume is much larger. It's a five-fold increase. And so we thought, well, with that much bigger change in the volume, we should see different results. And in fact, we did. The, the, the very large non-zero volume didn't perform as well. Didn't have anywhere near the, the thrust, uh, the impulse. <laughs> okay, just wondered. I mean, I, 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 I have flown you know, some different, in fact, maybe not some standard pistons over the last two or three years, the original Landis designs. And, and uh, I, I think probably there's some advantage in the non zero, but I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I've what, developed what, a little what, bit what, of a. Maybe the volume was exactly you know, what, it, what would be the right number, so I just wondered. I mean, I've developed a bit of a, a, a hunch about this that I really don't have any hard data to support, but it's. I guess it's my best guess at this point that the volume depends more on the motor than the piston itself or the length of the piston. Um, so smaller motors probably, you know, smaller non-zero volume. But we haven't really conclusively proven that. I mean, we did we did apply that in you know in our 
competition events here. When we flew payload, we had the 55-inch piston, but we used a one-inch gap, whereas this is a 2.75-inch gap. So we thought smaller motor, go with a smaller gap. But I don't have any hard data to support that. No, it probably is a function of the mass flow out of the nozzle. I just wanted, like I say, if you were looking at methodology, open our viewer. All right, time. Thanks very much.